fortunately, since we're speaking about uh, the world of public spheres and algorithms, it was obvious who I wanted to talk about, which is Ben Franklin. Uh, and, and I have to say, uh, I didn't actually have to go out and buy this Ben Franklin action figure. Um, for reasons I do not understand at all, people just sort of give them to me. My, my, my students, my, my boss, this one is for my wife, uh, so I don't pretend to understand it, but I actually, I'm kind of okay with it, because in the grand scheme of things, if you were gonna have a favorite founding father, Ben is not a bad way to go. So not just because he was an inventor, a scientist, a, a printer, a diplomat, the man was a player. Uh, to quote the scholar P. Diddy, he was in fact all about the Benjamins. Uh, he was a businessman, he was an entrepreneur, and the job that he had for the majority of his, his political career was centered around communications and centered around this concept of the public sphere. And it was his job as postmaster. And he took on the job of postmaster of Philadelphia in 1737. He was either Philadelphia's postmaster or postmaster general of the colonies until 1774 when the British finally realized that he was actually a revolutionary and that it would be a really good idea to fire him. But the reason he wanted this uh, was that it had a lot of benefits for him. It had piles of patronage jobs, and he had a really big family that he wanted to hand them out for. He communicated all the time, so having franking privileges, that ability to just sort of send mail for free, big deal for Ben. But the real reason it had advantages is that controlling the postal system had an incredible synergistic effect with the fact that he was a printer and a newspaper man. Because when Franklin started working on the Philadelphia Gazette, he bumped into this very interesting problem. He's putting out a newspaper, and he bumps into this difficulty, which is that the postmaster won't deliver it. And when you are creating a publication and suddenly you have a non-neutral channel for information delivery, you have a real serious business problem. And so as Franklin gets more and more power, Within the postal system, he comes up with a reform that turns out to be both very, very progressive and very, very profitable. He basically says, I don't care what you're printing. I am going to charge you a small fixed fee and we're going to deliver it. And what this actually leads to is this really interesting space where we start getting a postally based public sphere. And it's a public sphere of print and letters. People are sending out newspapers, people are responding to them via the private mail, but it's allowing this utterly vast new political agglomeration, spanning from Boston to Charleston, to try to figure out how to have a conversation about how this new land should be governed, how we should live within it. So Franklin dies in 1790, uh, and shortly after this, uh, another Ben, uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who's another revolutionary, he's a physician, passes the most interesting piece of 18th century law that you know nothing about, which is the Post Act. And the Post Act does three things, right? It basically gives the new government the right to establish postal routes. Good idea, figure out where it goes. It secures privacy of the mails, which is a really big deal. There is basically no privacy of the mails at this point. In England at this point, the entire espionage apparatus is based around seizing mail, opening it up and reading it. Uh, the truth is secrecy of the mail doesn't do very well in the US. In 1798, we passed the Alien and Sedition Acts and basically, you know, not so much for privacy. But the really cool thing this act does in 1792 is it establishes this crazy set of subsidies for the post. And what these subsidies basically do is they make private communication quite expensive. And they make newspapers dirt cheap. In fact, the pricing difference is so severe between sending a newspaper and sending a private letter that by about 1820, 95% of the mail by weight is newspapers, and it provides 15% of the revenue. So you're talking like a five to one, an eight to one pricing disparity. What becomes pretty common in the early 1800s is that if you are a cheapskate and you want to write a letter home, you go out and you buy a newspaper and you either underline or put pinpricks under the words and then you send it in the mails and mom gets it and reads everything fine, send money, just based on the fact that you've found a way 
to send the letter for about a fifth of what it costs. So that's not the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. If you are a newspaper publisher, you can get what are called exchange copies. What this means is that any newspaper can send any other newspaper a copy for free. There is no carriage cost. The postal system simply delivers for free newspaper copies back and forth between these nascent newspapers. And publishers love this. The average newspaper in 1830 is receiving 4,300 exchange copies per year. These little newspapers are literally swimming in a sea of print that is coming from all over the country, being sent into them, and they had a slightly looser interpretation of copyright at that moment than we tend to enforce at the moment. And so what they were doing was taking this wave of newspapers cutting in the door, literally cutting and pasting them together, and putting together their own newspapers. So what happens in 1792 is we end up with this highly subsidized public sphere that is designed to provide a distributed civic space that covers every corner of the early American country. You end up by 1830 with 8,700 post offices. You end up with 430 in the state of Massachusetts. There are only 351 towns in the state of Massachusetts. Three quarters of the civilian employees of the US government in 1830 work for the post office. Early America, the American state in about 1830, is a postal service and an army with a very, very small democratic government in charge of it. So this is the history that the United States is coming out of. We have had from very, very early on efforts that try to figure out how we establish a public sphere. And the reason that we do this, the reason we end up with this very, very different kind of public sphere than the Habermasian public sphere that we're trying to argue about is that we have a goal for a very different sort of government and a very different sort of democracy. This is not meant to be a government for a small group of bourgeois who can get together in cities and talk over coffee. This is meant to be a government where the farmer can be a full participant as long as he happens to be a white property owning male, all disclaimers apply, where you can have a much broader range of citizens spread out through a much broader range of geography trying to be involved with this public conversation. We talk a huge amount when we think about the foundation of the United States about the ways in which we set up representative democracy, the ways in which people come together at state and federal levels, we don't talk nearly enough about the media environment. And this media environment is one that is explicitly built to have this conversation about what is the public sphere and what it should look like. So why talk about this? I, I wanna talk about this. So first of all, I, let me just sort of say, I know nothing about this. I am, I'm basically, regurgitating Paul Starr's Brilliant, The Creation of Media. You should go out and read it if you're interested in all of this. I teach it every year. And the reason I teach it every year is that I think if you're gonna talk about what the press does and what the press is for, it's actually really important to sort of go back and look at this history. And the reason I like going back and looking at this history is I think that when we look at the challenges that we're examining today, some of them are genuinely novel and a lot of them are not so novel. So one of the things when I talk about this set of problems, I often end up talking about the privatized public sphere. But of course the point being, the public sphere in the American sense has been privatized since day one. These newspapers were absolutely civically powerful entities, but they were also advertising vehicles. Somewhere between 50 and 90% of the text in most of these newspapers in the late 1700s and 1800s were advertisements. You look at the fact that a lot of these papers were named the advertiser. There's a reason for them. They are basically commercial vehicles that have a small amount of content to keep people interested in reading. 
And there's a funny way in which you can actually sort of look at this as a form of targeted advertising, because in fact, a lot of the content is coming from this weird newspaper net, right? It's coming from this wave of exchange copies, and basically editors are sort of selecting what they think is going to be appealing with a local audience, and then putting targeted advertising on top of it for local merchants, and then sending it out in one fashion or another. So to one extent or another, you can argue that some of this has a long, long history behind it. There's other pieces of it that don't have as long a history behind it. Uh, as Dan and Robin put out in, in, in the briefing documents, this idea that this public sphere run by private corporations is going to be wholly unregulated, that's quite a bit more new. So talking just about this act of 1792, which constructs this set of cross subsidies, even talking much more recently with the Fairness Doctrine, we have not historically been shy as a government in the US in saying we want the press to behave in certain civically minded ways. What is fairly recent is this sort of anti-regulatory corporate libertarian stance that's built perhaps on some questionable assumptions that any regulation of press is naturally a violation of the First Amendment and that any attempt to control a technology-driven country is going to be, a company is going to be anti-innovation and is going to break things down. So I don't think this rise in inclusivity, which is one of the big things that we tend to look at when we look at the political shift that comes from the internet, is completely new, in part because the establishment of the press in the United States was a massive increase in inclusivity. If you wanted to run a newspaper in England, you had a bunch of serious problems. One of them was caution money. You had to put up hundreds or thousands of pounds against the possibility of future fines. So if you were going to violate any press laws in the future, you had to basically put down a deposit that guaranteed that you would be able to pay for this, which basically meant that unless you were both extremely wealthy and extremely well-connected, you could not print. And once you get to the United States, you have Franklin, who is decidedly a middle-class tradesman, able to start putting out the Philadelphia Gazette. And that's an enormous shift, this idea that ordinary people have access to the media. That is a shift that we've seen before. One of the things that comes from it is an information explosion. And we're fond of talking about this idea that we have an explosion of information, people are overwhelmed by it. This is a really old concept. I often teach my students about it, and I, I point to work by Her, uh, Herbert Simon, who in 1971 starts talking about an information explosion that threatens to drown us in a sea of information that is chipping away at our scarce resource of attention. And the technical innovation that he's talking about is the Xerox machine because he is terribly, terribly worried that his scholarly colleagues are going to start drowning him in pre-press manuscripts. Uh, and he's right to worry about this. And it, it turns out to be one of the major things that, that ends up getting in the way of your attention. But this is something that we see even in the 1700s where suddenly you have the possibility of more newspapers that you can read. And therefore, gatekeeping is also not new to us very much what the editors of these papers are doing in the 1700s is reading from this incredible public sphere, filtering it out, putting things in front of you based on what they think you want to read. And editors have never been transparent. They've never been particularly easy to interrogate their decisions. In fact, a lot of this enthusiasm in the early 2000s for unfiltered media comes from this notion that we're going to unseat these gatekeepers. So there are things that are different. It's certainly different that the pervasiveness of these algorithms, the difficulty of escaping from them, the fact that it's very, very hard to opt out of some of these systems and essentially say, I'm not going to read on Facebook anymore. All of that may be different, but some of it is also the same. Ideological isolation. If you pick up these papers from the early 1800s, these are very, very partisan papers. There are a lot of historians who make the argument that the party paper precedes the party in American politics. 
you don't end up with the Republican and Federalist parties. You really end up with networks of newspapers taking advantage of this crazy cross-subsidy to send content back and forth that end up evolving into these two emergent papers. And so it was certainly possible to catch yourself into one or another of these echo chambers. What may be different is the lack of transparency. If you were subscribing to the New York Evening Post in 1801, you knew that Hamilton had founded that paper, you knew he was a Federalist, and you knew what echo chamber you were entering into. And what may not be uh, historically supported is the ways in which people do not understand to what extent algorithms may be shaping what they see. And when you look at work by, you know, Carrie Karahelios and Christian Sandvig, where they talk to people who know Facebook very well, who spend, you know, 10 or more hours a week, and interrogate them and say, do you understand that what you're seeing is algorithmically controlled, and the vast majority say no, that may well be a very, very different place to be. So, Look, I, I'm certainly not here as a scholar of American press history, which I've already admitted I know nothing about. Uh, I'm not actually someone actively involved with studying algorithmic governance or transparency. I'm actually here as a funder. Uh, so I'm on the board of Open Society Foundation. Um, we are one of the sponsors of this event. We spend a lot of time thinking about what are the necessary precursors to an open society? If you want to have self-governing societies, if you want to have an engaged civic public, what do you need? And we're pretty cool with the idea that you need a free, uncensored, aggressive, investigative press, right? We, we've seen that in almost every country we've worked in. We're really comfortable with that. We do a lot of support around that. Despite the fact that George Soros is not exactly a heavy Twitter user, we are starting to get increasingly comfortable with the idea that free, open channels of information where anyone can publish, anyone can access information, anyone can amplify, anyone can curate, that that is also an essential precursor to an open society. And a lot of the issues that we've gotten involved with, issues like net neutrality, issues like anti-censorship, these are issues that we've gotten into because we feel like this is absolutely necessary to see globally the sort of civic and public spaces that we want to see. What I do not know is whether algorithmic governance is the space that we want to be in. And we're trying to figure this out along with other colleagues in this space. So a uh, little more than a year ago, the Ford Foundation, and, and let's be honest about this, Lori McGlinchey, to a large extent, uh, and the Ford Foundation helped bring together a bunch of foundations, including MacArthur, including Knight, including the Mozilla Foundation, around this effort called NetGain. Uh, and the idea behind NetGain was that we were curious whether there are problems in the internet and the public sphere that neither corporations nor governments were going to be able to take on. And whether this was a place where foundations and NGOs might be able to sort of move in and say, can we make some real progress around this? So about a year ago, we launched this net gain challenge. We basically stood up and said, tell us what you think are the big unaddressed problems around the future of the internet. Help us figure out how we're, how we're going to work on them. Um, this past summer, uh, we had a conference, Lori was largely the organizer behind, around creating a pipeline of talent, uh, tech talent, into public interest careers. And so this is a way of getting these different foundations together, getting them working together and thinking about this. But we have a very large range of issues that we'd like to work on. And many of them have to do with access to information. Many of them have to do with the openness of these online spaces. And a lot of them really come down to this question of what sort of digital public sphere do we want? So we don't know. We know that the digital public sphere is incredibly important. What we don't know is what, if anything, we need to be doing to ensure that it's inclusive, generative, more civil, less civil? I, I don't know. 
Like, I'm not even sure what we would want to be shaping the digital public sphere to do. And, and so I'm really interested in understanding the role that we think algorithms are actually playing in this space. But I also want to say that I'm a really big fan of the null hypothesis. Uh, and I actually think one of the things that we have to be taking very seriously is the idea that these algorithms that we're very concerned about and very interested in may be having a lot less influence than a lot of other factors out there. Uh, I found Eitan Bakshi and, and Lara Damich's paper looking at how users are choosing content on Facebook very compelling because it makes this argument that, yeah, absolutely, the algorithm has an effect, but there's a whole other set of personal and social effects that may be significantly more powerful. Uh, and in Rewire, I basically make the argument that, yeah, there's a filter bubble, absolutely, but its effects are tiny in comparison in the ways that we already put filtering on top of the way we encounter in the world through basic sociological phenomena like homophily. So I want to understand what are the potential risks and what are the real risks here. Uh, and I think there may be real risks. A lot of my work right now focuses on this idea that a lot of people are trying to make social change through shaping norms. And a huge amount of that work unfolds within a digital public sphere. And to the extent that algorithms are making it easier or harder for people to do that work, that has enormous implications for very important social forces like Black Lives Matter. And so looking at something like Zainab's work, looking at Ferguson and essentially saying, how do we know when we see Ferguson? How do we see the ice bucket challenge? That may well be incredibly important. But a lot of this work at this point is still at this level of saying, what do we know and, and, and how do we know whether it matters? So look, Dana and her team have a, an incredible room of people here, people doing really cutting edge scholarly work around all of this. I'm thrilled to be part of it. But I, I wanna ask you to help us think about the practical sides of this. Um, that there's a group of foundations well represented in this room that are trying to think about, is this a place where it makes sense for us to intervene? And if we were to intervene, it would be based around having a certain amount of confidence that this system is not working well right now, and a certain amount of confidence that there are things that could be done to make this a more civically generative and participatory system. And that this work would have to be done incredibly carefully because as Dana pointed out, a lot of this is unfolding in a US context where there's a very, very strong precedent around freedom of expression, including the freedom to, to, to dissent and to offend, and that it's also unfolding in a technological space where there's an enormous precedent around the freedom to innovate, and that's a freedom that no one really wants to interfere with. So I, I wanna suggest this, that, that what I'm finding is that many of the questions that I wrestle with this day, uh, these days boil down to this very simple question, which is what is it that we want citizenship to be? What is it that we want citizens to do in a public sphere? What does a public sphere have to make it possible for citizens in an open society to do? And so this is a conversation that was very much on the minds of people like Ben here when they were trying to figure out the rules of the road for the society that we end up living in. I think as we're dealing with this incredible, fertile period of change, this is a wonderful time for the people in this room to be engaged in very similar conversations. So, Thank you. those were my five minutes. <laughs>